A ship carrying gas explodes in Boston Harbor. A Chinese dam collapses, unleashing a 50-foot tidal wave. The East Coast is plunged into days of darkness by a blackout. And in London, a train carrying nuclear waste crashes, enveloping the city in a radioactive cloud. These nightmare scenarios could happen because we have become addicted to energy. And like any addict, we don't care how we get our fix. But now the consequences could lead to global disasters. Satisfying our energy needs has reached crisis point. The race is on to plug the gap between diminishing supply and growing demand. Especially for supply that is clean, green, and cheap. What will happen to the world 100 years from today is actually fundamentally quite frightening. Many people don't appreciate just how frightening it is. So we need a new industrial revolution. America's Secretary of State for Energy, Professor Stephen Chu, is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He deals in science fact. We had incredible energy resources, and so we built an infrastructure and a set of habits based on abundant energy uh, for 200 years. Rapid global industrialization has helped create global prosperity. But it also has addicted the world to fossil fuels, now poisoning and warming our planet. In the next 20 years, we'll need 60% more power to satisfy the new, emerging global economies. But what will be the source of that new power? Fossil fuels? Nuclear? Hydroelectric? Each has advantages and risks. Our generation's response to this challenge will be judged by history. For if we fail to meet it boldly, swiftly, and together, we risk consigning future generations to an irreversible catastrophe. Oil is the fossil fuel that drives the world's economy. Oil is black gold, dirty but precious. The world is hooked. If you look back at the history of the 20th century, in some ways, it is the history of oil. It's been a driver of geopolitics. It's been a driver of, of uh, military policy for a lot of countries. Uh, and it has, at the same time, it has been sort of the fuel for the engine of economic growth. The US is a society built on oil. Transport, commerce, food, medicines, all inextricably linked to oil with a huge trillion dollar infrastructure built to support it. But the world's oil reserves are fast running out. We may already have passed the peak of production. Our reliance on oil also makes it a potent political tool. One used in the past and most likely in the future. U.S. government advisor and global energy security expert Paul Domjan understands the dangers. We remain hostage to a relatively wide range of possibilities for oil to be disrupted, any of which could, could cause problems with world trade or even cause economic growth to come to a halt. Disruption of supply by accidents and even terrorist attacks is now the global economy's Achilles heel. 80% of the world's oil passes in oil tankers through six narrow shipping channels, also known as choke points. The Bosphorus Strait in Turkey connects Russia, the world's second biggest oil exporter, with the rest of the world. 
The Bosporus is probably the most likely single point in the world that would cause an, an oil shockwave globally. If the Bosporus were closed, 7% of the oil that every day goes on the open ocean and along major international pipelines would cease to be shipped. Disruption of oil supply could throw the world into turmoil. Turkey, 2015. A tanker loaded with 150,000 tons of Russian crude oil navigates through the Bosporus, which is, at its narrowest point, just 2,200 feet wide. Iran, Russia's main oil export competitor, is suspicious of Russia's links with the West and oil deals in the Caspian Sea. A terrorist group with Iranian sympathies plows a suicide boat loaded with explosives into the Russian tanker. The sunken tanker blocks the Bosphorus to all traffic. Oil markets react instantly to the news. As soon as the Bosphorus is closed, phones will start ringing in trading floors around the world and oil prices will rise immediately. But there's worse news. Africa's biggest oil producer, Nigeria, is in turmoil after election results are contested. Oil has been systematically disrupted in Nigeria for political gain for the entirety of the last decade. The disruption in the Bosporus would provide a great opportunity for them to amplify the impact of their disruptions. Nigerian militants capitalize on the Bosporus oil market collapse by disrupting the oil wells. Another 5% of the global supply is lost. With 12% of oil supplies disrupted, prices spiral out of control. After just three days, motorists begin panic buying petrol. People are forced to seek other means of transport. As oil prices increase, truckers protest, blockading roads. But the price keeps rising. We could be well above $130, $140 by the end of it. And those are the kinds of prices that triggered the last recession. It takes four weeks to reopen the Bosphorus. It's already too late. The world plunges into global recession. Is the United States prepared to deal with, with, with another oil shock? The answer is no. Is the world economy prepared to deal with another oil shock? The answer is no. Until we can develop alternative fuels for transportation, the world remains at the mercy of the oil markets. Weaning ourselves off fossil fuels is a slow and expensive business. But there is a fossil fuel that is fairly cheap and also plentiful, natural gas. Our existing sources of energy are running out but also polluting and warming our planet. Are we heading for crisis point? In an energy-starved world, natural gas is becoming an increasingly attractive alternative for generating energy. It emits half the carbon of coal and one-third the carbon of oil. Demand for gas is growing. But in its gaseous state, it's expensive to transport so it's compressed 600 times and cooled, becoming a liquid gas known as LNG. One giant tanker can hold 36 million gallons of LNG in pressurized tanks, enough to power a city like Boston, Massachusetts for a week. But a tanker is extremely dangerous. LNG explosions are a firefighter's nightmare. Lancashire, England. Firefighters train for an LNG accident. The freezing liquid doesn't burn, but as it pours out of a ruptured container, it vaporizes and spreads uncontrollably. Now the gas cloud becomes highly volatile. Once ignited, it burns at 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, twice as hot as petroleum.
If you had a large gas spill and it ignited, what's going to stop you initially getting too close to the fire is the radiated heat, which you can feel on your face now. The surrounding air becomes so heated, firefighters can't get close. This is just a small training fire. An accident in a busy port would involve millions of gallons of LNG. That would be a potential bomb. I would imagine it's a, a firefighter's worst nightmare for something like that to happen in a harbour in, in the middle of a city. At present, there are 11 ports that handle LNG tankers in the US. The one in Boston is in the heart of the city. Candice Kelshaw is an expert in maritime terrorism. Her research has revealed that LNG tankers could become a target for future terrorist attacks. The most likely scenario would be that you would have an officer who would have quite a few years under his belt, been at sea, knows LNG ships, um, is familiar with the, the environment at sea, and has become radicalized and now has a suicide mission planned. Such a scenario occurred in 1999. An Egypt Air 767, traveling from New York to Cairo, crashed off Cape Cod. The cause was never determined, but experts believe it could have been a radicalized co-pilot on a suicide mission. A suicide mission in a city harbor would be catastrophic, affecting tens of thousands. MIT professor and former chairman of the Massachusetts Port Authority, James Fay, published a report outlining the dangers of an LNG explosion in Boston Harbor. You just have to look at the population of people out of doors in a space like this. Anyone within a half mile of the waterfront could be hurt. Twenty fifteen, Boston Harbor. A one thousand foot tanker carrying thirty three million gallons of LNG sails at five knots, just over walking pace, into Boston Harbor. Close by is downtown, East Boston, Logan Airport, and Charlestown, all densely populated. As is normal, when an LNG tanker approaches the harbor, no other traffic is allowed on the water. Security is tight. Helicopters are overhead, the roads are closed on the side, bridges are closed. There is a moving security cordon on either side of the vessel. But the massive security presence is looking the wrong way. A radicalized crew member has planted a bomb next to one of the LNG tanks. It doesn't take very much to blast a very big hole in the side of a tanker. The bomb's explosion splits the side of one of the tanks and the LNG pours out. It ignites, rupturing the other tanks. Once that occurred, then you're looking at, at what would be the most catastrophic thing, which would be a cascade failure of each of the tanks. Thousands of tons of liquid gas pour into the water. The LNG comes in contact with what it would regard as red hot liquid. It is so cold compared to the water that it just turns into vapor. The LNG expands 600 times as it vaporizes. Wind carries the vast vapor cloud towards downtown Boston. The cloud erupts in a fireball 1,000 feet high. A vast thermal radiation wave pulses through the city. This isn't fire, but heat from the explosion. So hot that it ignites anything in its path. That circle identifies the region within which there would be harmful radiation to anyone on the shore. 
The gas would only burn for 15 minutes, but would be long enough to devastate the city. That's an enormous fire. We've never seen anything like that, and I hope we never do. But as long as LNG is shipped into harbors like Boston, the threat remains all too real. Trying to run this kind of business in old, crowded ports where a lot of people live nearby has got to go. We've got to get the danger offshore, and then there's no problem. But while this would address the problem of safety, it does nothing to change the fact that gas is a fossil fuel and harmful to the environment. To address the growing need for cleaner energy, planners are going back to the future and are looking once more at nuclear power. We are now in a desperate race to secure enough energy to power our future. As the threat of global warming increases, there is growing pressure to reduce carbon emissions, forcing governments to reconsider nuclear energy. Right now, if I looked at the technology for coal and the technology for nuclear and environmentally its impacts, well, only one of them has no carbon emissions. So I would, quite frankly, favor nuclear. It is estimated that over 500 nuclear plants in 30 countries will be in operation by 2025, despite the long shadows that hang over nuclear power. In 1979, a partial meltdown at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania led to the release of radioactive gases. Then, in 1986, a disastrous accident in the Soviet power plant at Chernobyl led to the deaths of up to 500,000 people. This confirmed the worst fears of the anti-nuclear lobby. But the tide is turning. Energy planners now believe the nuclear industry has learned its lessons. We now know how to operate nuclear power plants in a safe way. The designs are far safer than the Chernobyl, and far safer than actually Three Mile Island design. But one problem persists, the safe disposal of the nuclear fuel rods, which remain lethal for centuries. If this rod had been just withdrawn from a reactor, it would be so intensely radioactive that my survival rate would be less than 1 of a second. John Large is a world-renowned nuclear scientist. The unsolved problem is the back end of the nuclear process. What do you do with the intensely radioactive fuel once it's served its purpose in the reactor? Nuclear waste is transported in specially designed flasks that are tested to the limit. Tests like these proved the flasks could survive a 100 mile per hour train collision. They are also designed to withstand a fire burning at 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes with the fuel rods shielded in water-filled compartments. But according to John Large, that may be their fatal flaw. I was concerned about the thermodynamic performance of this because if it's in a fire, there's no way of venting the excess pressure buildup that occurs. This flask is full of water, so it turns into a pressure cooker. Such conditions could occur in a railway tunnel fire. July the 18th, 2001, Baltimore, Maryland. Population 600,000. A 60-car freight train laden with flammable chemicals derails inside the Howard Street Tunnel, resulting in an inferno. Physicist Dr. Marvin Reznikov investigated what would have happened if nuclear flasks had been involved in the tunnel fire. Some of the cars were glowing reddish-orange, and that would tell us that the fire would have to be around 15 or 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Nuclear waste flasks can withstand temperatures like that for only half an hour. The Baltimore Tunnel fire lasted five days. 
John Large has calculated what could happen if such a disaster struck one of the world's biggest cities. London, England, July 2015. Spent nuclear fuel from a Magnox reactor is en route to the world's largest reprocessing plant at Sellafield in England. It makes a routine rail journey through the heart of London. The train approaches a half mile long tunnel north of the city centre. In the darkness, a badly maintained track buckles, derailing the train. Fortunately, the protective flasks are intact. But before the train's crew can raise the alarm, a freight train laden with oil rumbles into the tunnel, plowing head-on into the derailed train. A spark ignites the spilt fuel. The tunnel's brick walls act like a furnace. Temperatures rise to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Fire crews constantly assess the radiation levels. They know it's time to evacuate. Pressure that builds up and builds up very rapidly in about an hour and a half into the fire would be sufficient to actually break the flask open, enable the fuel particles to be broken up, released into the atmosphere. Even though only 1% of the radioactive fuel is likely to be released, it's all it takes to create a deadly plume over London. The weather dictates the number of people exposed, which could be up to 700,000. There may not be any immediate deaths, but during the next 50 years, thousands of Londoners could die as radioactive elements like cesium and plutonium lead to cancers. The decontamination operation is immense. Sewers, water systems and green areas are closed until safety is established. Streets and buildings washed down. Some areas could be contaminated for thousands of years. Sooner or later, spent fuel now stored on site at US nuclear plants will need to be moved putting American cities at risk. Yet the growing need to fill the energy gap has forced the nuclear option back on the table. I think nuclear power has to play a significant role. As we transition to renewables, it's going to take some time. So I think it is a part of our mix. Nuclear power could offer a short-term solution. But could we harness the power from the rivers of the world to provide an endless, clean source of energy? Our hunger for carbon-based energy is destroying our planet. We must find cheap and safe solutions to answer our energy needs, and many believe that the answer is water. It is a resource that is found on every continent. Combine water with gravity, and you have an infinite source of clean, green energy, hydroelectric power. But the giant dams needed to hold back the water have an environmental cost, reducing the flow and damaging the ecosystem downstream. And if a dam ever collapses, the death toll can be shocking. In 1975, a 50-foot wave killed 230,000 Chinese when the Bankyo Dam failed. It was a typhoon that overwhelmed the dam, but we've got to be able to anticipate those kind of storms and make sure that they're designed properly for those extreme loads, especially when you have extreme consequences. 
But despite the risks, China, Argentina, Congo, India, Vietnam and Mexico are all planning massive super dam projects. This is La Yesca in western Mexico. When it's complete, this hydroelectric dam on the Santiago River will be one of the tallest in the world, more than 700 feet high. We are installing 750 megawatts of power here, enough to, to give energy to the city of Guadalajara, which is uh, 5 million people. Ensuring a 700-foot high wall of water stays in place is the overwhelming priority of Chief Engineer Fidencio Mendez. Factor of safety should be very, very high. We can't allow any minor deficiency because downstream we have two, two more dams and it will work as a cascade, it will be a disaster. Dams have to cope with unpredictable rainfall which raises water levels rapidly. Dangerous levels of water are channeled away safely by a spillway, a sort of overflow. Engineers design dams to meet the most extreme conditions, like a rainstorm that might come only once in a thousand years. But global warming is forecast to make unpredictable weather more frequent and more extreme. Experts now predict the world's 45,000 large dams need to be upgraded to protect them from the effects of global warming or the consequences could be dire. China, 2015. The country leads the world in hydroelectric power generation. Its population, now 1.4 billion, consumes more energy per day than the United States in a week. Its latest dam is built to withstand a one in 1,000 year flood. An unprecedented category five typhoon strikes, unleashing 80 inches of rain in just 24 hours. Debris carried by the rising water blocks the spillway. If the dam was not operated properly for the storm, or if the spillway were clogged with debris, you can get more inflow than was ever anticipated. With the spillway blocked, the water level rises rapidly. A landslide crashes into the reservoir, releasing 5,000 tons of earth and rock. 800 million cubic feet of water overflows the dam, sending a massive wave rolling down the hillside towards the villages beneath. A further seven dams are breached by the wave as it sweeps downstream. Whole communities are washed away an area the size of Los Angeles is flooded. Hundreds of thousands die. Super dams can offer plentiful energy for many countries, but the unpredictability of future weather means there is an added pressure and risk. However our future energy is generated, it will all be for nothing if we can't get it from the power plant to where it's needed. It turns out that our power grid could be the weakest link of all in our future energy supply. We're facing an energy crisis where any disruption to the delicate balance of supply and demand can lead to disaster. But even if we solve this crisis, can we trust the grid to reliably supply us with electricity? America's first grid was created in New York City almost 120 years ago, and then rapidly expanded to cover the whole East Coast. 
but it's now old and prone to failure as it struggles to cope with ever-increasing demands for energy. If we lost electricity tomorrow, we'd pretty much go back to almost a Stone Age existence. Professor Tom Overby is an expert in the stability of the U.S. grid. It would be hard to imagine the modern world without electricity because we depend on it for just about everything we do. When the lights go out, pretty much nothing gets done. 180,000 miles of transmission line have been grafted onto America's ancient infrastructure. To keep the electricity flowing requires constant care. Our relentless dependence on electricity means cables can't even be powered down for maintenance. How do you repair a 5,000 volt line you can't switch off? Very carefully. Specially designed helicopters allow technicians to work on live lines. You might do it every day. Can't get complacent with it. You have to think about what you're doing all the time. The secret of working on energized cables is to attach yourself to the live line so you are grounded. Put the wand on the wire, the whole helicopter, the people, everything gets energized to the same potential. The team know that if they make a mistake, it will be fatal. Aviation in and of itself is not inherently dangerous, it's extremely unforgiving. And this is a little more unforgiving than that. Hey, we're off. I'm good. Despite this constant maintenance, the aging grid still fails. August the 14th, 2003. A cascade of failures plunged some 55 million people on the eastern seaboard into the dark. The blackout shuts offices and strands commuters, but within 24 hours, it's over. If we don't improve our transmission grid, we're probably looking at more potential blackouts in the future, certainly if we have a growing population, which we do in growing electric demand. The grid of the future must cope with a 30% increase in demand in the next decade alone but it faces new challenges. Extreme weather and fires already cause 40% of all major power outages. Climate change will bring more intense hurricanes, more floods and blistering heat waves. Outages of the future could last much longer than 24 hours. The East Coast, 2015. Global warming is all too real. The East Coast is gripped by a blistering heat wave. High temperatures and increased demand causes transmission lines to overheat, causing power outages across the grid. In a cascading failure, what happens is one line trips, it causes an increased flow on the other lines. If another line trips, then that causes more and more flow, so eventually you just get a cascade. The overload ripples through the system, jumping from circuit to circuit until the entire system crashes. The great blackout of 2015 has begun. New York is hit first. Elevators stop. Subways come to a halt. Four million commuters are stranded in the darkness. After 24 hours of blackout, with repairs underway, there's a new disaster. A massive summer storm sweeps over the eastern seaboard, damaging thousands of lines. Within 30 minutes, lights go out across 10 states, from Michigan to Vermont, and all the way to Canada. 
By day two, it's clear the northeast US grid has suffered significant infrastructure damage. Petrol stations can't pump fuel. Food rots without refrigeration. On day three, in the stifling heat, millions are forced to abandon their homes. If you live in a high rise and it gets hot, you're gonna have to leave because it's gonna become unlivable inside that building very quickly. Open spaces become refugee camps across the Northeast. Day four. At hospitals, patients die as backup generators run out of fuel. Food and water is rationed. Panic takes hold. Looting breaks out. Law and order breaks down. Thousands of extra grid workers are drafted in from Texas and the West Coast to help restore supply. It's not as simple as just flipping a switch. The power grid just is not designed to supply everybody with their full electric load at the same time. Places like hospitals, police stations, fire stations get electricity first, then it takes quite a while to get to the residential neighborhood. As the fixes are made, power stations restart and the grid splutters back to life. Society gradually resumes normality, but the cost of the blackout is in the billions. The risk of this disaster can be reduced, but will require an upgraded and smarter grid. But to power this grid of the future, the hunt is on to find a green, carbonless source of energy and better ways to deliver the energy. Scientists now believe the holy grail to the energy crisis could lie in recreating the sun here on Earth. In the last 100 years, the use of energy has revolutionized the way we live. But it has also fundamentally changed the planet we inhabit. So we must find new sources ones that are plentiful, but above all, clean, without carbon emissions. Leading the U.S. into this new energy revolution is the job of U.S. Energy Secretary, Professor Chu. There's an incredible opportunity to say, all right, we have the greatest research and development and innovation machinery in the world. Why not take the opportunity to become the leader in this industrial revolution. And solutions exist. Clean, abundant energy is available, enough to power the entire world many times over. There's plenty of renewable energy around. At least five times as much wind available compared to the total power demand. The amount of sunlight is even more. If nature is able to provide many times more energy than we demand, why aren't we using it? Green energy, though clean, renewable and abundant, is often dependent on the weather. Electricity is generated only when the wind blows or the sun shines. This solar panel array in the Mojave Desert captures 13 hours of sun a day but we have an around-the-clock energy addiction. Environmental engineer Professor Mark Jacobson believes that combining a variety of clean energy sources can overcome the problems. We want to be able to combine wind and solar as much as possible because they're very complementary to each other. If you just have wind alone, it's not going to be as smooth as a conventional power plant. However, when you combine wind with solar, and use hydroelectric to fill in the gaps. It's not only smooth, it matches the demand perfectly. But there's another challenge for renewable energy. Transmission, getting the supply from where it's produced to where it's needed. 79% of Americans live in cities, often thousands of miles away from the windy Great Plains or the solar arrays of the remote deserts. Renewable energy will need to be carried over vast distances, which will call for new transmission technology. 
Normal electric cables have resistance, and that resistance causes some loss of electricity. If we can use superconductors to transfer electricity, we could get a lot more electricity down a cable than we can using traditional technology. Superconducting cables have zero resistance, allowing the transmission of far greater electrical loads over much greater distances. They are expensive, requiring rare alloys, and are only in the experimental stage. But if successful, they could distribute renewable energy to every corner of the US. Far further into the future lies a technology which could be the holy grail of energy production. A technology that uses laser beams to recreate the energy of a star right here on Earth. Ex-astronaut and physicist Dr. Peter Weisoff is working on a new kind of nuclear power, fusion. It's a carbon-free source of energy. It's a limitless source of energy. Uh, the major constituent of the fuel is found in seawater, which is certainly abundant here on the Earth. Current nuclear power depends on fission, splitting atoms. At Livermore, they're preparing to fuse atoms by heating hydrogen to 180 million degrees Fahrenheit. These conditions are only found inside stars, enabling them to burn brightly for billions of years. The key is a laser, the biggest in the world, more than a kilometer long, focused on a minute target. It all happens in a few billionths of a second. This is a very short laser pulse, and it goes in and it heats this target to extreme conditions. All the matter collides together, reaches a temperature of 100 million degrees, and we get the fusion process to occur, and it's all done in, a, in an instant. The energy released is harnessed by heating liquid salt, which produces steam. This steam powers huge turbines to generate electricity. The release of energy from a fusion reaction is 10 million times greater than from burning coal. System shot sequence running at T minus 10. The challenge of fusion eight, is how to make seven, that instant last six, longer than a few billionths five, of a second four, and three, to produce more energy two, than it consumes. One shot. Scientists hope that this could be achieved by 2040. If and when they do, it will be the dawn of a new age of energy production. But until then, overcoming our addiction to cheap and dirty fuels will be a challenge. But if we could use it less and more efficiently, we're halfway there. Let me go back to the most important thing. 20 years from today, the biggest decrease in carbon emissions will come from energy efficiency. Energy efficiency and green technologies can solve our energy crisis. As Professor Chu sees it, the choice is simple. Here you have an incredible opportunity, you know, behind door number one. Economic prosperity, leadership, wow. Behind door number two, disaster, you choose.